Hey, it's Amy. We are trying something new today, mostly because this past weekend was a total bust in terms of reading, and I have no new finished books to review. I basically spent the weekend and most of last week drinking, eating greasy, fatty foods like this, and this, and this. That didn't mean I didn't read at all, though. I have been reading Eye of the World, the first book in the Wheel of Time series, which I have somehow never touched before last week. Like, I didn't even know that there was a TV series coming out until two days ago. So, I don't know, where the hell have I been, right? I actually picked up the book because my sister put it on her TBR list and I decided to give it to her for her birthday. And there are very few books that she reads that I myself haven't read, so I figured it was time to finally read. So far, I'm liking it a lot. It reminds me of The Fellowship of the Ring, sort of. Then again, many epic fantasy novels kind of remind me of The Lord of the Rings, but it's just the setup that they have with a small group of people from this quiet, peaceful, narrow-minded village being forced to flee in the night from dark creatures um, by crossing a ferry accompanied by a magic wielder and a silent warrior type dude. I don't know. I couldn't help but make comparisons because of that. Whoops, sorry. Had to go answer a chat question. I am basically manning a virtual information desk right now, so it works the way the information desk you see at most public buildings do. Basically, if a student or staff or faculty member has a question, they ask in the chat box and we get notifications for it and one of us will pick it up and answer it. Anyways, where was I? Um, oh yeah, so I was gonna say, I love the female characters in this book. I like Moraine and I like Egwene. Is that how you pronounce I don't know how you pronounce their names, honestly. I think it's Moraine and Egwene. Anyways, I'm gonna go eat some milk bread because I made milk bread over the weekend. I don't know what I did wrong this time, but the taste is much blander than it usually is. I probably measured the sugar incorrectly or something. After that, I have to play exterminator and take my vacuum hose to my window screen because a couple days ago, I was staring out the window and I noticed this. They're hard to see because they're very small, but these suckers suddenly appeared on my window screen, and they've just been hanging there all day and multiplying and not moving anywhere. I, since I filmed this video clip for to send off to my friends and family, there are double the amount that there were in that, that clip. They are small enough to fit through the holes in the screen. I went and googled to see what they are, and I think that they are hackberry psyllids. I swear, ever since I moved here, I have become some kind of like bug expert. I also am starting to notice more trees and plants than I normally do because these hackberry psyllids apparently hang around and infest hackberry trees, which I didn't even know existed until a couple days ago. I vacuumed these bugs up the first time I saw them, but more of them appeared in a matter of hours, so I'm hoping this doesn't become like the birds with bugs. I ordered some citronella oil and right after I finish eating the milk bread I'm going to go vacuum up these creatures that are currently there and then I'm going to rub citronella oil all over the screen and pray that that keeps them away for now. I feel like I'm being held hostage in my own apartment by bugs and I never thought I'd say this but I kind of want that giant wheel bug from my previous videos to come back because that thing was like the king of bugs. When it was around, no other bugs dared to grace my window screen. I would gladly welcome it back right now. Seriously. Okay, so I have finished fighting in an epic battle with the bugs on my window. As you can see from the screen, there are currently no bugs. I don't want to jinx myself. Oh shit, no, there's, there's one bug at the corner. One bug, and I looked at the screen inside as well, and there's one bug on there. I rubbed the screen with citronella oil. I don't know if that's actually going to work, but it does make me feel reassured and makes my apartment smell really nice. Some people don't like the smell of citronella oil, but I think it's quite nice. It's a very clean scent. I fully expect to keep finding bug corpses if I'm lucky for the next few days. And if I'm not lucky, I'm going to find live ones just hanging around my house. Because while I did suck it up with my vacuum hose, and I thought I did a pretty good job of it, they were still trying to get away from it. I found some on the sill, I found some on the wall underneath it. This wasn't very pleasant. I need me one of those Ghostbusters backpacks, the ones where you can just hang on and then use the hose without having to stop and like pick it up and move it along. I need one of those. Like if this battle is going to continue and happen every single day, I have to be prepared. A good thing that came out of this, in addition to the current crisp clean scent in my apartment is that my window screens were scrubbed for the first time since I moved in. That is nice. You should have seen the paper towel when it came off. It was completely black. Very disgusting. Fuck, I could have sworn I saw one just now. Just like a tiny little 
leg or something peeking out from the crack right there, but it's no longer there. Maybe I'm just being paranoid. Anyways, I'm going to go back to work, and after that, I will do some reading. So I am in complete despair. Not sure what to do. Woke up this morning, saw a few Hackberry psyllids on my window screen. And then I proceeded to rub the screen with citronella oil, and this time it didn't work. Within an hour, they started coming back. I didn't even bother with the ones inside my room. And then I read that if you vacuum up these bugs, they can escape uh, because they are pretty small and they're not going to get crushed inside the vacuum. And I don't have a bag vacuum, so they're less likely to be suffocated. So I run the risk of them being able to crawl out again if I vacuum them up, especially since I just dumped out the contents of my canister vacuum yesterday and they're less likely to be crushed in there without anything else to what crush them i guess so in today's battle between woman and nature nature has won i thought about maybe buying like raid or something to spray them but that stuff's toxic and if they keep coming back just because i am not spraying the hackberry tree itself then there's no point I am just going to live the rest of my days with my windows closed. Fresh air is overrated anyways. I feel rather solemn. I imagine this is how the romantics felt back in the day when they took off and went to write in their cabins by the lake. Except I would never go to a cabin by the lake because that just seems like it would be infested with bugs. Bugs control my life. I swear they do. Like, I have spent the past hour looking up insect killers, insecticides, bug vacuums. Um, apparently no-kill bug vacuums are a thing, which I don't know why you would bother. If you don't want to kill them, just freaking leave them there. I don't know. It just it makes no sense to me. But where was I going with this? Oh, yes. Oh, crap. Like There's something on my ceiling. I hope it's not a hackberry psyllid. It's pretty small. I found a spider on my screen, too. I didn't mind that thing being there. It was a weird-looking one, though. Kind of reminded me of a black and tan, like the beer drink. But yeah, I was just on Amazon scrolling through, trying to find something to take care of this problem. I looked at bug zappers. I looked at those zapper racket things. Yeah, I don't know. I think I'm just going to just not look out my window for the next couple weeks, at least until the weather gets colder. Because it is still in the 80s here, despite it being November already. Which is ridiculous, but you know, that's what happens when you have global warming. Anyways, yesterday I said I was going to go ahead and read Wheel of Time. I mean, Eye of the World, right after I stopped filming. But, you know, plans go awry. And I ended up making absolutely no progress in that book. However, I did pick up a different book because I don't know why, but for some reason, I tend to read faster when I read several books at once versus just one book at a time. Like, I know that technically I'm probably reading at the same pace, but it feels like I'm reading faster and that makes me actually read faster. I don't know, it's hard to explain, but I do know that I definitely finish books faster when I read several at once. This time I've tried to go and just plunge ahead. I went, okay, I'm going to read only this one book and it didn't really work out for me so i last night just felt like reading something else i picked up ghost wall by sarah moss i keep wanting to call it ghost moss but it's ghost wall by sarah moss this was recommended to me by one of my friends at work she said it's a lot like that movie midsummer which i watched recently um, and i did like that movie so i said okay i'm gonna go ahead and check it out and so far i'm only at like i don't know 20% or something, so they're just at this, not a commune, they're basically camping out at like some archaeological site, and they're trying to figure out, um, I mean, they're trying to see what it was like to live back then, as in everyone's wearing these scratchy tunics, like cooking without using uh, modern uh, like tools, I guess. Um, and the main character is there with her parents. I'm still not sure what her parents are doing there because I thought her dad was the professor that was in charge of this little dig or um, 
trip that they were taking, but there's a natural professor there and her dad is just there. So I don't know what he's there for. I know he's a like an outdoorsman. He likes to go camping and his family has to go with him, but it doesn't explain why they're there. Um, dad's kind of an asshole. I don't really like him. But in a way, he reminds me of my own dad. <laughs> not because, not the asshole thing, even though my dad can be an asshole, but, but it's more of the, um, the, the fact that he keeps going on and on about how he doesn't um, understand why, you know, in modern times, people need this and that in order to live. Like he goes like, back in the day, people didn't have medicine and they were fine, stuff like that. My dad says stuff like that all the time, by the way. Um, and it drives us nuts because we're just like, is it people died back then because they didn't have medicine. And now you have medicine and you won't take it just because of some weird antiquated values you have. I don't know. He, he's gotten worse over the years. He used to be much better, but now he, I don't know, he, in his old age, um, something snapped, I guess. But yeah, so that's where I am in that book. I also was playing um, Little Hope, which I actually finished. I don't think I really like this one. I prefer Until Dawn, even though I didn't actually play that myself. I watched someone else play it. But and, and, and Until Dawn isn't part of the um, Dark Pictures anthology, even though it should be. Like, it really feels like the first installment in the series. But yeah, like this one, um, I don't know. Everyone was just hateful. Like, I didn't like any of the characters. The ending, at least the one I got, was really weird. I guess I'll have to play through several times in order to really get an idea of what it's like. But I'm kind of lazy to do it because it wasn't a game that I enjoyed exactly. So maybe I'll just watch other people play or do speed runs or something and see what all the other endings say so I can get the full story. Um... What else? I guess I'll go back to reading. My workday is pretty much over, so I'm going to go ahead and um, read more Ghost Wall, and then I'm going to watch a movie. Okay, so I've been in this position on the couch for what felt like the past four hours or so. I just finished watching The Lighthouse with Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe, and it's the fucking weirdest movie I've seen in a long time. I don't know if it's a good weird or not, like I've seen some weird movies lately, but this is like completely bizarre and I'm still not sure what exactly I watched. If you've seen it already, let me know in the comments what you think about it, but I don't know if I liked it. Like I'm leaning more towards no, just because it made me so deeply uncomfortable but my friend who recommended it to me said it's good that it makes you uncomfortable but i don't know like for me horror movies tend to make me feel uncomfortable but there are two different types of discomfort like there's a discomfort where i like there's a discomfort where it's like okay well it's uncomfortable because it's uncomfortable because it's a horror movie so it's just like okay well Someone's being stabbed. That's not pleasant to watch, you know? And then there's this, which is uncomfortable, where it's just really hard to, like, stomach it. Like, I stopped several times during this movie, and I never stopped doing horror movies because that's part of what makes it more horrifying. But this is, like, a different... It's not the jump scare horror. It's a psychological horror film, and I still don't know, at the end of it, who... It's a crazy one between the two characters, and I mean, by the end, they're probably both kind of off, but, you know, like, at the beginning, were they both off, like, already, or what? Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's gonna bother me for a while. I'm gonna have to go watch some interviews with the cast. This is the smallest cast I've seen in a movie. There's only four people, so, <laughs> and only two of them had a lot of scenes, and uh, but the girl was only there for the weird sexual fantasies scenes. And that's another thing that made me uncomfortable. Like, sexual horror makes me extremely uncomfortable. Like, and not in, like, the, wow, that made me uncomfortable and that means it's a good horror movie kind of way. It's just, it makes me uncomfortable in a way where I'm like, was that even necessary for this movie to, you know, still be 
good. Uh, another thing that grosses me out is vomit and just like just stuff that's like not clean. And so I guess like lots of horror films have that. And I remember when I was reading the Southern Southern Book Club's guide to slaying vampires, like the same thing came up where like there were scenes where somebody would spit up food or um, roaches would appear or in um, for example, in The Exorcist, the main thing I remember from the movie is that scene where she vomits out all that green stuff. I don't know, that was just so gross to me, but that was like the scariest part of the movie for me because I just hate, <laughs> I just hate vomit and just disgusting bodily functions like that. So, um, so I guess in a way it kind of succeeded in grossing me out and creeping me out and I don't know, like I... I need to think about this. I need to reflect upon it. Like, I actually paused the movie in the middle to go bake some chocolate chip cookies. Like, I didn't bake it from scratch or anything. I had the dough. Like, I already had made chocolate chip cookies last week. Um, and then I took it and froze the, the leftover dough. So I just took it down last night and it was in the fridge. So I just basically paused the movie, preheated the oven, and stuck them in the oven. And I was just munching on them during the movie. But luckily, I stopped myself, like right before the gross scene as in like the gross scene to me wait so let me tell you what it's about it's basically so robert pattinson and willem dafoe play like these two men who are watching over or i guess maintaining a lighthouse like they're like in charge of its like um maintenance and upkeep and everything so willem dafoe is there all the time like he is the, the lighthouse keeper and robert pattinson is this newbie who is working as his assistant. So he goes to this lighthouse and it's completely isolated. Like, I mean, I know lighthouses are on like, you know, a little island and like we're on a rock, it's like kind of like by themselves, but this is like so isolated that ships hardly ever come there. And the waters around there are so choppy that um, basically if anything happens, like if a storm comes or anything, um, a ship might not be able to get out there. And then the people, like if there was anyone on the island, they're stuck fending for themselves for the longest time, like for however many months until the ship could finally get back to the island um, or the rock. It looks more like a rock to me. It doesn't look big enough to be an island. But um, but yeah, so Robert Pattinson's character goes to this, um, like starts a job as an assistant to this um, old former sailor. He's like a parody of like... Um, basically a ship captain that you would see in like a classic adventure novel like he's very like he swears he drinks he tells stories satan's sea shanties he um like is abusive towards robert pattinson's character and i was wondering like throughout it like i couldn't really place like exactly what year this was in i was just like is like is this normal for him to be treating like his underling like this like it like for this time period was it normal to be this abusive i know people in the past were like very horrible to employees but like at this point in time is it normal for lighthouse keepers to be like this harsh and cruel towards their like their staff um and i mean that question was answered later on in the movie but, but um but yeah like he the manual says that they're supposed to rotate shifts so one person's supposed to be up at the light um, doing what I always think of lighthouse keepers doing and the other person will be downstairs like main um, you know uh, cleaning and fixing machinery like bringing um, I don't know materials in from outside I'm not sure what materials they're bringing in like but uh, throwing out trash stuff like that um, like, but yeah, like, the, like, so Robert Pattinson gets assigned to do all those horrible chores while Willem Dafoe's character gets to just, um, be in charge of the light at the top of the lighthouse itself. And he never lets, like, his assistant up there. He says, like, it's my light. <laughs> and, um, he's very possessive about it. Um, so yeah, like, a big chunk of the movie involves Robert Pattinson doing chores um them eating dinner together and um and then robert pattinson trying to get up to the top to see the light and not being able to get up there and yeah like i'm not gonna spoil it in case you want to see it but 
But yeah, like, it's just two men in a lighthouse for however long. <laughs> and, and it starts to drive them mad. I'm gonna go off and watch some interviews now so I can see what, um, what they say about it. Like, maybe it'll change my mind, who knows? Maybe I'm just not smart enough to understand what um, Robert Eggers was going for. I saw The Witch before this, and I really liked The Witch, so... Um, I don't know what happened with this one. Maybe it's just not my thing. I think it's- I, do, I hate to categorize movies and books by gender, but I seriously feel like this is more of a guy's movie than, than I would like. Like, as in, it's so very obviously told through a male lens and <laughs> And it just um, didn't work for me. Okay, so I went and I watched several interviews, one with Robert Eggers and one with Robert Pattinson. And there's a super long one about the screenwriting for the movie itself that I'm going to watch in just a sec while I do the dishes and take a walk because I've been lying here like a blob while overeating for the past month. I exercise for the first time in a month today and I barely did 15 minutes <laughs> and, and like the thing is like well, every time I exercise I feel really great afterwards but getting myself to do it is very hard and I've always been pretty active even though everyone makes fun of me for not like being sedentary but I'm actually pretty active I mean I know it looks like I look like I sit behind a desk all day and for the most part I do but um but yeah like I actually um like, can usually move around a lot more than that. Like, 15 minutes is not enough for me. But, like, today I did 15 minutes and I felt like I had done half an hour. It's going to take me a while to get back into shape. So anyway, so I was watching those interviews and I realized I actually never commented on what I thought about the acting and, like, the production aspect of it. Like, um, I still don't like the movie. <laughs> I've decided, like, I don't like, it's not for me. Um, and even with like the explanations and all the other stuff, like I still don't like it, but I can appreciate it. And I, I do think like, okay, so in the interview with Robert Pattinson, he talks about the humor of the movie. And when I first saw that, I went, what humor? It's, you know, freaking weird. But then I, while I was watching, I was texting my friend the whole time because he had, you know, he he was the one that recommended it to me and he like he loves the movie so i was just basically live um messaging my reactions to him and i went back through and i looked at it and i went wait i was laughing there were scenes where i was like ha ha ha, ha. like i can't believe that happened and or ha, ha, ha like that's just so funny so yeah like there were humorous moments um, unexpectedly um and robert pattinson was saying like it would have been so dark and gritty and horrible if they didn't have the humor to break that up. And I think that is where my problem is with this movie because I came in expecting something where it was going to be dark and humorless and super bleak. Um, like when you think about a lighthouse movie with two guys stuck and going mad, that's what, like, that's what I pictured. And the humor, part of the reason that, like, the humor confused me, I guess, is because it made it feel more like they were, it, it just felt wrong. Like I went, like this is wrong. Like they're obviously going mad. That's why they're laughing and <laughs> dancing with each other and, and all that crap. And he also talked about like the horror of isolation. I myself am somebody who is very, very comfortable being alone. So I think for me, the horror is actually that you're isolated with somebody that you absolutely cannot trust and even dislike. So that's what's horrifying, not the fact that you're isolated by yourself. I mean, um, th I mean that sucks too. But but honestly, like it would have been if I were them, I wouldn't have preferred to be by myself, honestly. So, so yeah. Anyways, I just wanted to say that. Um, and now I'm going to go watch that one hour long interview with Robert Eggers to see, like, just to hear about, um, you know, his inspiration and everything. Because, like, there are things I do, do like about this. Like, the, the whole maritime aspect and the, the folklore. 
like the mermaids and all that that they bring in. And, um, they don't feature heavily in the plot, but it's just like the whole image of like what you think of, like Im imagery that's associated with like maritime life. Uh, like I, I really like that kind of thing, and I want to hear more about why he chose to take the route that he did. Okay, so it's Friday night, and for some reason, I keep on being surprised every time I hear one of my neighbors. Like, I've heard someone laugh, I've heard someone shout, and every time I go, oh, there are other people around, but of course there are other people around. It's Friday, and COVID's happening, so nobody can go anywhere. People want to have fun, so I'm just used to me being in on Friday nights and everybody else being out, and uh, that's the end of the story. Anyways, yesterday I took the day off of work, and I played The Sims 4 for six hours in a row. That may sound crazy, but I had so much fun. I felt like I was scratching an itch that I had not been able to reach for the longest time, and I... It started a whole new storyline, played in a whole new world with a different set of characters that I could mess around with. I downloaded some stuff from the gallery, um, didn't do any reading <laughs> because I was too busy with The Sims. Um, anyways, tonight I am drinking this lovely red wine that I ordered from my friend's aunt. She works for a winery or a wine company, I guess, and they make... Um, clean crafted wine um and they're in california and normally i would go clean crafted i don't do that shit like i don't i don't do gluten free i don't do fat free i don't do any of that stuff but this got me because they said in her family like my friend's family they're big wine drinkers like they drink um so much wine and they were just like the great thing about clean crafted wine is that it doesn't give you hangovers. Now, I don't know if that's actually true or not, but I heard that and immediately I went, I have to have it. I have to at least try it. So I'm on like my third bottle uh, right now, and this one is the Resident, I believe. So it's the Resident Zinfandel, and it's really tasty. Like I opened the bottle today and I am almost done with it. I was watching this horror movie. I swear, this channel has become a horror movie review channel <laughs> or something. Uh, I didn't intend for it to be that way, but we on Netflix earlier and they suggested, hey, Amy, you have this item in, on your list that you still haven't watched. And I went, what item is that, Netflix? And they said, it's a movie called His House. And I don't even remember adding the movie. I don't remember what it was about or anything, but I went, you know what, what the heck, I'm going to watch it. So it's a horror film about uh, Sudanese refugees going to England and they get placed into this kind of ramshackle house, although it's pretty big. It's bigger than lots of the case workers' houses as they keep on commenting, but it's in this kind of um, shady neighborhood where there's trash on the lawn and um, the neighbors are kind of suspicious looking and are suspicious of the people too um, because they're not white. But anyways, they go to this house that they're placed in and there are roaches and rats and vermin all over and holes in the walls um, but they start to realize that something is in the house other than them like something possibly supernatural and they suspect that it followed them there from Sudan because um, of something that they did in the past and that will get revealed later on but um, but there's Sudanese mythology embedded into it. And the idea behind it is that you are haunted by the ghosts of your past trauma if you don't confront it and don't heal. From it. So it's very much a story about being refugees from violent conflicts and needing more than just being placed in a different area in order to get past uh, the hurt and the grief and torment that you experienced um, while you were still back in your home country. And this one isn't a horror film like The Lighthouse or The Witch, but I felt like it hit home more for me. Like I've said before, like my family uh, were war refugees. Um, so even though I didn't have that experience myself, I grew up with all those stories around me. And um, so I'm very sympathetic to the plight of refugees all around the world. Um, so with this story, like, I didn't know that was how the, the, the placement process worked for refugees. Like, I kind of know how it works in the U.S. just because it came up so much um, in the news and everything in the past few years here. But um, I'm not familiar with the process in England at all. Um, 
I suspect it's kind of similar, but like, but what I don't get is that, and I saw this actually in Vera when I was watching one of the episodes. Um, she, like, one of the women involved in this um, this case that Vera is working on, is a refugee who's illegally working at this restaurant, and she she tells Vera to you know please keep quiet because she's not supposed to work while she's living in this. Um, house or like shelter I guess for refugees but I don't and they tell this um, likewise they tell this um, main couple like the same thing they said like they were going to give you a house we're going to give you like basically allowance for um, every week for a ye up to a year and you can't commit any crimes and you're um, going to be you have to submit reports weekly we are going to check in on you and the status of you know, like basically how you're set settling in and on um, the condition of your house, even though we gave it to you in shit condition <laughs> to begin with, and you're not allowed to work, like at all. And that's the part that I don't get. Like, I know that if you're like not permanent resident status, I don't know, if you don't have like some kind of work permit, it's hard to get work well uh, b before that, but but I don't understand why they explicitly forbid refugees from working instead of just giving them a work permit. I don't know, like, what are they supposed to do for a year? Like, I'm not saying, like, you know, you have to work to earn your place or anything, but, like, I would think that, I'm like, it seems that many of the refugees, um, like, whose stories I've read, like, they do want to work, so um, I'm not sure why they're not allowed to. I suppose I need to do more research on this. But, yeah, back to that um, thing I said about mythology. The wife believes that they are being haunted by this... Um, I guess it was a sort of witch, and it really made me think back to The Lighthouse, and I know I said I did not like The Lighthouse, but obviously something resonated with me because I woke up this morning, the first thing I thought of was, oh, I remember in The Lighthouse this happened. Um, so even if I don't like the movie, I am glad I saw that movie, um, and it has got me thinking a lot and I there's a friend I want to talk to about this she's one of my closest friends we went on a road trip together through New England and um, Robert Eggers has said in several interviews that his movies The Lighthouse and The Witch are both very much New England movies like New England folklore New England stories and as someone who grew up on the opposite coast I feel like I don't really I, I, I'm not getting, um, like, I'm not fully appreciating it the way that someone in New England would. Um, at least that's the sense that I'm getting. And, uh, like, I wanted to talk to this friend about it because when we were on the East Coast, we were looking out at the ocean. And, you know, we grew up in California, like, on the coast. And, like, you would think, like, okay, so that's the ocean. I, I mean, these houses or towns, they're, like, on the coast as well. Um, it would be like a similar experience, but it's not. Like the culture is completely different, lifestyle is completely different, their beliefs, the their folklore, it's completely different, which is so strange because we're the same country technically, but each state is like almost like its own different world, um, or at least each region of the United States because it's so big, I'm assuming. Um, but yeah, and it made me, made me think about, because um, like he talks about like New England folklore, how, you know, the mermaids, the lighthouses, the stories of the sea and Poseidon and all that, Triton. Um, and the same with um, with the witch. Uh, it, so in the witch, they keep, there are many scenes where they show like um, a hare, like a rabbit, um, appearing. And they mention that back in England, Ireland, Scotland, um, I think the hare is supposed to represent a witch. So when you see it, you know, like, okay, like, there's a witch. Um, but um, if you're not familiar with it, you look at it and you go like, what's with the bunny? And I definitely was one of those people. I was like, oh, a bunny. <laughs> it didn't mean anything more to me than that. Um, but yeah, the whole thing really got me thinking about um, folklore and uh, like origin stories, all that. And what the mythology is where I'm from, like on the West Coast, like what are the stories that I grew up with, and I really thought about it, and I think it's um, like gold rush stories. Like those are probably what I grew up hearing, and um, Native American mythology. And I know I, I shouldn't be lumping all Native American tribes together, but I have to confess, like I, uh, up until recently, like maybe like the past few years, I did think of Native American tribes as like 
as more of a collective entity than as separate individual tribes. And now I realize that that is not the right way to go about it, um, and I have started paying way more attention since then. But um, these stories I grew up with, like they're from childhood, so it's too late to remember them as anything other than Native American myths. But yeah, those are the stories that I grew up hearing. And also, since I'm um, from Southern California, it uh, there's a lot of Mexican um, influences, uh, so Mexican, Mexican-American. All of my teachers in elementary school were white, but I remember at least two of them were married to um, Mexican or Mexican-American men, and they um, read us a lot of stories like from Mexico. I like Those are the stories that I remember from my youth, and I feel like um, depending on the kinds of stories you grew up with, like that affects kind of how you see the world and even like what you fear, like when it comes to horror films and stuff, like there are certain things and that I don't find scary at all that I think I'm sure other people find scary and you know there are things that I fear like bugs that other people might not even bat an eyelid at. We were talking today because it's Friday the 13th about how um, like one of my coworkers pointed out, like, oh my god, guys, it's Friday the 13th. And then another coworker was born on the 13th, and he said, it's, you know, like, I, I, I think of it as a lucky day because he's had birthdays fall on Fridays before, and it's never been a big deal. And then we talked about, like, how, and like, there are a few cultures in the world where 13 is actually a lucky number. I don't think it's very common but you know it does happen and how in other countries like different numbers are unlucky like for example i think in china number four is unlucky though i'm not really sure about that but i know um in vietnamese superstition like you're um, not supposed to take a photo with three people like because that left person in the middle is going to die that's a really old superstition though and most people don't adhere to it anymore it's only at weddings that i see it being followed i don't know why but it's like i mean, maybe it's because like everyone has like old aunties or great aunts around telling them not to risk it but at a wedding if you're there and i think it's like um odd number so it's like a three of five um basically we have family of three taking a picture with a bride and groom which happens all the time they just drag it on random like i've walked past before i go to the bathroom or something and they've been like get in here <laughs> like they'll do something like that in order to avoid getting that unlucky number of people in the photo so it's very interesting like what um different cultures think is bad luck I did do some reading tonight. I finished um, Ghost Fall, which I mentioned I was reading previously a couple days ago. I started, got through like Mimi like with the book. It's not a very long book, <laughs> and um, I read the rest of it just lying on the couch with my wine glass <laughs> after the movie. It's a very weird book. Like I know my friend said it's like Midsummer. I can kind of, kind of, kind of see it, but it's just so strange. Like, and it's so. How do I put this? It's just so white in terms of the horror. I, I'm not sure how to describe it. I can just say that um, like there's a strange obsession with um, connecting to your origins like from like back in the day when your ancestors were Iron Age warriors or hunter-gatherers or whatever. And uh, like so I, I said earlier that the story is about um, and I still don't know, by the way, the main character and her parents are going along, I can only assume as guides, because like I said, her father is just like some outdoorsy guy, like, and he happens to know like the terrain well because they go camping so often, I guess. So they are there with this professor and his um, students, like three students who are doing research on uh, the Iron Age and like life back then. So they're in... I think it's Northumbria. I'm not familiar with English geography. I just know it's Northern England, and I'm thinking like, um, where, like where Vera was set. And they are living, like you know, roughing it, like wearing burlap tunics or, <laughs> or whatever. And the father um, of the main character is very abusive, or he's obsessed with giving people the impression that he's like this macho man who's um, every 
orders, whose every order is obeyed by his wife and his daughter. And his wife lets the cook fire go out, even though it's a freaking hot day, like he beats her, like not in front of the others, but like they know. And, um, and it's the same with his daughter, like whenever one of the others pisses him off, like there's a f one female student and she talks back to him, like she thinks he's very chauvinistic, which he is. And um, she talks back to him. And when she does that, like all he can do is kind of, um, snide comments but he can't really do anything to her beyond that so he takes out his own daughter like he um hits her and um i don't know it was very uncomfortable to read and there are many scenes of just men play acting at being hunters and <laughs> going through old-timey rituals while the women collected food and got everything ready for them and washed their clothes and i don't know like they just play, like some kind of male fantasy about it's like i'm imagining like women playing like you know young girls playing at being a princess and this is like guys like little boys playing at being um i don't know what more of the warriors back then the picks like something like that the romans i'm not familiar with that history but but that's what it seems like to me like these people are play acting or playing at being um these warriors from or hunter-gatherers from back then and um like they basically just take it too far <laughs> and it's just unpleasant for all involved right after that i went and i read um so i have this really thick volume of grimm's fairy tales and it's supposedly like the most complete english translation there is so it's like 800 something pages i read most of grimm's fairy tales growing up like many of us have but there are some in here that i have never heard of like even like not even like heard someone speak of um like the one that i just read like there was one where um so there's this king in this de his deathbed and he tells his loyal servant like you have to take care of my son after i die and no matter what you do don't let him go into this room at the end of the hallway because <laughs> there's a um, there's painting in there of this super pretty girl um uh, the princess under the golden roof or something like that because if he sees that he's gonna fall unconscious and then he's going to uh, basically be uh, miserable and like uh, something like that and then um, he dies and so the servant uh, tells the prince like you know you can't go into any of those places like so he takes him around the castle and says well this is yours and this is yours but don't go that route so of course the prince goes well now that you've told me I have to go in that room or else I'll die like of curiosity so he goes into the room and he sees the painting and he immediately he goes like he falls unconscious and then he goes like you know who is that girl and they're like she's very hard to get to don't even think about it and he's like I, I must have her like I'm, I'm in love <laughs> and he goes um so they like uh, so the uh, the servant who I think is more of an advisor like he's not really like just a mere servant but the servant says this girl is always surrounded by all these nice golden things like made of actual gold so in order to go and um like i guess hold court with her you're going to have to bring um things made of gold so they get all these people in the kingdom that know how to make things out of gold um what do you call them anyway <laughs> it's like it's like sculptors but with gold they basically all put, like force all of them to make these like golden items for this king who is incredibly selfish in my opinion because you know people got jobs to do i hope he actually paid them instead of just forcing them to make all these random items for this girl that he saw in a painting anyways they set sail to this castle um and the prin they trick the princess to go onto the ship because they're like, oh, you have many items and they've addressed as merchants, by the way. And then she goes on the ship and as soon as she gets on there, they sail off. And she's like, oh, help, I'm being kidnapped by a merchant. I'd rather die than, like, go with him. And the prince goes, wait, like, don't worry, I'm not actually a merchant. I'm a king and therefore deserving of you. And I just love you so much. I had to have you. And she goes, okay, I guess that's all right. <laughs> she marries him and i was like what the fuck <laughs> um but yeah it, like so while they're on the ship getting ready to head back to their his kingdom like the servant overhears these three birds talking and like about like all these ominous things are going to happen once they get back and they're like okay well you know um if the prince does this or the princess does that they're going to die and um but if someone stops them like by doing this then they won't die but the person who stops them is going to have this part of his body turn to stone that part of his body turn to stone and, and so on and so forth but you, know, you can see where this is going they get back all this shit happens and um the loyal servant 
um, steps in each time, and he is eventually uh, turned com almost completely to stone. But like the last act that he does is he <laughs> slices open the princess's breast and sucks out like drops of blood to prevent her from dying because of whatever thing like curse was laid upon her and the prince is like outrageous like he must be executed so he um he's about to be executed and then he tells a story and he gets turned to stone and then the prince and princess are like crap i mean wait they're not prince and princess anymore at this point now they're now king and queen anyways uh the the king and queen are like crap like this guy was so loyal and we we did him wrong but it was too late because he him, like he's stone he's practically dead so um they have twin boys and then the the queen is at, in church one day and the boys are playing the king's watching over them and then the statue starts whispering to the king and he's like you know um hey like do you want to save my life and the king's like yeah i want to save your life like you are the best servant ever and the king um so this the statue says okay in order to save my life you have to give up what you love most like you have to cut off your son's heads and rub their blood over my statue and the king's like oh no that sucks but i'll do it and he kills his sons rubs their blood over the statue the servant comes back to life and he goes like you know thanks like i knew you could count on you um let's save your son so they basically he does something and heals the sons and like their heads are reattached and they're alive again and then the queen comes back and the king tells them to hide in the closet and then the queen goes uh where are the like where are the boys and um and the king goes like the, the the king tells them the same thing the servant told him and he says like well um we have a chance to save the servant and bring him back from like some state of being but we'd have to sac sacrifice our sons and she goes you know i don't want to do that but we do owe him a debt, so so let's do it. So the king's like, yes, I'm glad you were going to do what I did anyways. And he goes, surprise, they're all here and alive. And that's the end. I can only assume this is some kind of morality lesson about paying the debts that you owe and being loyal and knowing your place but i don't know like it, it i read it and i was just cackling out loud the whole time like ah, i can't believe this is actually a story i'm actually reading it but um well yeah i read it and now i'm just very confused but well yeah that, that pretty much summed up my evening i think i'm gonna go play the sims now to, to cleanse my mind of all that because i didn't enjoy what i read tonight i was munching on potato chips just now and it made me realize i don't think i've eaten a vegetable or anything healthy even remotely for the past few days i've just been eating crap i am in danger of getting sick getting fatter or just becoming constipated any of those sound unpleasant so i have to get my shit together my house is also a mess which means my life is a mess but i'm not cleaning today so i guess it has to keep staying that way for another day more this morning i was eating my cereal and i decided i'm going to go ahead and read another grimm's fairy tale i don't even know what i'm planning maybe i'm thinking of going the rate of one or two per day for the next however many days until i run out um i am determined to finish this book despite my opinions about the stories so the one i read today was about this kingdom with a king and queen who have 12 sons and the queen is pregnant with um, a 13th child and the king goes oh you know what we have a daughter i'm gonna give her the kingdom and i'm gonna kill all her brothers to ensure that she gets to rule and the queen goes oh no what do i do and her youngest son, Benjamin, asks what's wrong, and she says, Your father has 12 coffins prepared for you already, and if I give birth to a sister, then all of you are going to die. So how about this? All of you take off and um, go into the forest to hide, and I will go ahead and raise a white flag if I give birth to a son, and I'll raise a red flag if I give birth to a daughter. So I thought right away this is going to be some Theseus Minotaur style shit where she raises the wrong flag, but that didn't happen. She raised the red flag, so the brothers are in the forest at this point, and they're like, oh no, like we can't return home. So they live in this, they find this cottage and they decide to live in it so they live in there and they're all really bitter and they go why should we suffer like this just because of a girl 
It makes us mad. From now on, we'll kill every woman we see. That's your solution? There are 12 of you. Like, you can easily lead a rebellion against your father. But they didn't choose that. They decide to live in that cottage instead for the next 10 years. And at this point, the sister is, um, I guess, 10 years old. And she is very pretty, of course. And one day, and I am quoting this, the laundry in the castle piles up so much that the princess notices that there are 12 shirts that are there, which I don't know what the princess is doing near the laundry to begin with, and I don't know how she could pinpoint that those 12 shirts belong to someone other than 12 servant boys. I don't know. But her mom goes, oh yeah, yeah, the, 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 those belong to your brothers who your father tried to have killed. And she shows her the 12 coffins, which I guess they didn't dispose of. And then the princess goes, oh, uh, let me go find them. So she walks for a day and gets to this cottage in the forest. And now I'm asking, if it's only a day away, then why didn't the king send people after his escaped sons to kill them to ensure that his daughter's reign isn't threatened? Anyways, she gets there, she sees Benjamin, the youngest son, in the house, and, and they find out that they're siblings, and, and um, they're very happy about it, and Benjamin goes, Oh no, but we promised that we'd kill every woman we see. So... Um, he goes, wait, just go hide in the tub. I'll take care of this. The brothers come home and Benjamin goes, um, I have something to tell you, but before I do, you must promise that you will not kill the first girl you see. And they go, sure, I guess. <laughs> and, and he tells his sister to come out of the tub and goes, ta-da, this is our sister. And they all go, oh, wow, that's great. And then they decide to keep living together. And the sister cooks and cleans for them, which <laughs> at this point... <laughs> Again, I ask, why didn't the king send someone after his daughter since she's his heiress? But guess that didn't happen. And also, she could have gone back to the castle and taken over as queen and then let her brothers come back, but that didn't happen either. Um, anyways, they lived there for however many years it didn't say. But one day, the, um, the princess sees these 12 lily plants growing in the neighbor's yard, which now I'm wondering, when did they get a neighbor? But <laughs> she sees these 12 li lilies and she decides to pick them, one for each brother, but as soon as she finishes, the brothers turn into ravens and fly off. And she's like, what? And then this old lady appears and goes, why'd you do that? Those are your brothers. <laughs> and then the princess goes, oh no, like, heck, like is there anything we can do to, to, to reverse this? And like the old lady says, yeah, but it's going to be hard for you. You're, you can't speak or laugh for seven years and not one second less because if you stop even right before the end, then the spell won't work. And the princess goes, I can do that. There's a king, presumably not her father, hunting in the forest, which makes no sense to me because if the forest is only a day's walk from the castle, then it's probably still in her father's land, which means that no king would come visiting unless her father was accompanying him. But, eh, you know, let's hand wave that away. He sees her and goes, oh, wow, you're so beautiful. You can be my wife. And she can't speak or laugh. So she goes, like, she does nod at him. And she, like, they get married, but she can't smile or, I mean, but she can't talk or laugh. And they live together for years and her, um, and the king's mother goes, like, it's not natural for somebody to be silent and, um, never laugh like that. It's one thing to be mute, but it's another to not laugh. She must be evil. It means you must get rid of her. And the king goes, oh, mother, really? Like, do I have to? And he decides to execute her. But, you know, he cries as she's starting to get burned on the pyre because, you know, he loves her. And, um, but of course, like, while she's standing there about to get burned, the seven years time limit is up and her brothers transform back into humans and show up and save her. And she goes, like, and that she tells her husband, oh, um, let me explain to you what happened to me. This is why I couldn't talk or laugh all these years. And her husband goes, wow, that's awesome. And then they all live happily ever after, except for the king's mother who gets boiled alive in a barrel of oil and poisonous snakes. I don't know why you need the poisonous snakes in there when you already have the barrel with the oil because the snakes are probably just going to burn up in there with you. But eh, again, the fairy tale logic. So that was the end. And I was most displeased. But, you know, I really want to uh, are any of you out there fairy tale scholars? I have questions for you. I also really wish I could speak to the Grimm's brothers themselves because I found out recently that they were librarians. So, you know, from one librarian to another, I want to know um, why well, you pick these stories. Like, I understand, like, as librarians, like, oftentimes we don't get to just buy what we want to buy. Like, we have to buy what the people want to read and what reflects the society at the time. Um, I don't know if librarianship back then had the same principles, but that's what we follow now. 
nowadays. And if they were indeed adhering to those principles, then maybe that was just what people wanted to read back then. Which again makes me ask, why these stories? Um, anyways, right after that I picked up um, When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole, which has been in my uh, Kindle library wheel thing for about a month now. Like I basically got up in the library and I just uh, renewed it and never got around to it. And now it says I have a bit, little bit more than a day before they take it back from me. So I'm like reading as fast as I can. And I'm only a few chapters in, but they, but so far I am loving it. Like the writing style is very like casual and easy to read. Um, it's very sharp. The main character, Sydney, is a, a black woman living in a neighborhood in Brooklyn that is starting to get gentrified. And she sees like groups of white tourists being led through there every day on history tours, but the historical tours only cover the history of like famous white people who lived there, even though there were lots of famous black people who lived there as well. And, um, and, and her black neighbors are starting to move out like in huge numbers and getting replaced by um, white neighbors. It's like the next door neighbors who are this like really hoity-toity white couple who are incredibly racist and snooty and um where i am she's <laughs> trying to tell off this real estate agent who keeps trying to get her to sell her house um and she's like i'm not leaving like you can't make me leave um and, like there's comments from like some of the white characters about like these people are just never happy like they're never satisfied with what they've got which is absolutely ridiculous and like many of the white characters are obsessed with genealogy like you know where did they came? like i could trace my history back to new amsterdam and all that crap um anyways i'm liking it so far so i'm gonna go back to reading it i'm also gonna end the video here because i've realized it's gotten extremely long and i have a lot of editing to do so have a great weekend and see ya